言っちゃったから。<笑>
Good morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. Please stand as we sing our opening song.
Good morning, happy Sabbath, church family. Isn't it good to know that because he lives, we can face tomorrow? Can I hear a beautiful amen on that? Amen. Well, let, why don't you go around and say hello. Glad you're here. I give a good happy Sabbath to those around you. Welcome them to the family of God. Okay, well, we're so glad that you guys can make it to this church, whether you're here, here in person or streaming online, we are so thankful that you could join us here at Hinza Philem. Well, I wanted to share with you a few announcements. Number one, we are having a children's spiritual emphasis weekend start, um, that started yesterday. And we had a beautiful Sabbath school service just for the kids. So if you missed out on Friday and you also missed out Sabbath morning, you have one more chance. And this is not just for the kids. If you were there, you know, it's, it's very interactive from young, young to young at heart. So if you want to join us at 2 p.m., Mr. Jim will share a beautiful message for the kids and also the kids at heart. So join us in the fellowship hall at 2 p.m. Another announcement is this. This is for our youth. This coming Wednesday, we are going to have a video and board game night. Now, how many of you like playing games? Any board game fans here? Any video game fans here? So we're going to play a few games on Wednesday here starting at 7 p.m. Come join us because there will also be prizes. This is all for the youth. So if you want to play and come and also get some prizes come this Wednesday June uh, this coming Wednesday June 21 here at the church another one next Friday there's going to be a girls only Vespers this is going to be happening at my house so as you can see it's for girls so I'm not even welcome in my own house so all the girls are going to be there this is going to be led up by my wife and uh, Kirsten and they're going to have a wonderful time for all the girls, the high school age, and uh, all the high school age are welcome to join. It's going to be a potluck style, and it's going to be a nice time outside uh, with a bonfire. Next up, there's also going to be, that week is very busy of youth events, so we have video game, board game nights, we have girls' vespers, and then on that Sunday, which is next Sunday, we are going to go to Silver Beach in Michigan for a beach day. This is for the youth, but the whole church is invited. The more the merrier. So join us, beach day at Silver Beach, Michigan. Uh, I have that. I have there. We're going to do a June 25th on a Sunday, and for you guys, so you guys aren't confused. We're going to meet there at 9 a.m. Central Time. That means because we have to travel across. Um, the time zone, that is 10, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. So don't get that confused. Get there at 9 a.m. We're going to meet near the concession stand where the bathrooms are. If you want more information, come talk to me for um, directions and how to get there. And then, last but not least, for the youth side, for
for VBS. VBS is starting up soon. It's going to be a wonderful evangelistic series for the kids. And our theme is called Stellar, going out, out, out in the space, seeing the stars and the planets. So if you want to register your kids and to be sure that you're going to have a t-shirt for them, register no later than June 24. If you register past that date, you are not guaranteed a t-shirt. You can still register, but if you want to make sure that you have a t-shirt for your kids, register, talk to Marisol, or you could go online and register by June 24. Last announcement for you guys today. We are in the process of MMT, which is our nominating committee, Red, uh, nominating and uh, having new leaders for this new year. And I just want to do a simple call for all of us leaders, uh, members of this church, is that we're still looking for leaders. We need a lot of leaders, especially in the children's department. So if you feel impressed, I know many people have come to you and maybe asked to do this, do that. But think of this not just as just a responsibility, but as a way to serve God, and that by serving, you get to know who Jesus is a lot more. Because isn't it right that when you start teaching or when you start sharing the word, you grow in the process as well? So this is uh, a call for leaders, for those who want to be included in this church and to serve and to continue the growth of our youth, growth of our, our members into a further relationship with Jesus, this is for you. Well, my friends, that's all the announcements. I know that was a lot. But I pray that as we continue in our service, that our eyes, our minds are in tune with God this morning. Well, I want to invite our speaker for our children's evangelism, our spiritual emphasis. I'm going to call Mr. Jim up, and he has a great story for you. So all kids, come on up. You're going to sit by the stairs, go around to the, to the members, grab some offerings, bring it to the church in the middle. And come to the front for a beautiful choke start. Microphone on. There we go. All right. And Pastor Rodney, I'll invite you to hold on to the envelope. You saw that envelope earlier today. Well, boys and girls, my name again is Mr. Jim. Oh, you are looking great this morning. Did you have fun last night and this morning with everything? Good, good. And, and just so just so all the older kids know, last night. We actually learned how to use our hands, hand and eye coordination with juggling, and we took the life skills from juggling and applied it to us being Christians, and we focused on the Bible. Now today, for Sabbath school, 
we talked about all the different kinds of animals that God made at creation. And so I brought a special book with me. Now, I'm going to invite one of my helpers here, either one, if they'll just hold the microphone, okay? So I brought this special book. Now, here's what I did. I made a lot of pictures of animals. Do you like animals? Good, good. All right, so let's see here. Oh, look at this, look at this. What is that animal? Yeah, it's a cat. Now, see, what I did is I went through and I cut all the pictures. Here, I'll take all the ones here that I cut, and I'll take the top parts right here, and I'll go right through them, and you can see we've got a cat. Oh, what is that? A frog. What is that? A fish. Oh, a squid, an octopus. Oh, a raccoon, a cow. So all kinds of animals. Now, because I cut the pictures up, part of it is the head. And let's see, let's go down to the next section here. Now we have the middle of all those animals. See, all the middles. And then, here, flip all those over here. And then go down to the very end, the very bottom. And now we can see what kind of feet or what kind of paws or what kind of hoofs they have. See, oh, which one is that one? That's the frog. So we have all different kinds. So I thought today that what I would do is I would let you create a new animal, an animal we've never seen on this earth before, okay? So I'm gonna just take the cover here, turn this over, and what I'm going to do now is I'm gonna flip through the pictures and some of you are gonna pick the animal. Well, what, what is your name? I have an idea. I'll go through the top ones and I'll flip through and you tell me when to stop, okay? And then we'll see what kind of animal we can make with all three parts. Are you ready? Okay, so I'll just start flipping through the animals and you tell me when to stop. Just say stop. Right there? Oh, that's most interesting. Okay, we'll go with that one there. Uh, and now I'm gonna need another helper. What, what's your name? Me? Yeah, me, okay, me, I'll use you, all right? But I'm gonna guess that's not really your name. What's your first name? Mason. Oh, Mason, I met you during Sabbath school. That's right, you helped me out today and you read the scripture for me, thank you. So Mason, I'm gonna take that whole center section and you'll do the same thing that she did. You just tell me when to stop, okay? All right, here we go. Just say stop. Right there. Oh, this is very interesting, very interesting indeed. There is no animal that looks like this. Okay, so finally, we'll do one more. Would you like to do the last one for me? Would you, no, you wanna just watch? That's okay. Okay, but we do have a number of hands. Let's go to the very back row, the only one in the back row, okay? And I'll grab all the pictures on the bottom. All right, so you know what to do. You just say stop, okay? Here we go. I'll start flipping, just say stop. Right there? Oh my, that is really interesting. Now you have to admit, there are some really, really interesting creatures in this world that God made. I mean, God is so creative. But can you imagine this? An animal that looks like a cow on top, a bird in the center, and a fish at the bottom. I mean, this is what they came up with, okay? All right. No, we have never seen this. Well, wait, 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 wait. Hold on a moment. I did see this animal. Yes, I saw this animal once before. Um, pastor, would you stand up with that envelope? You see, I was asking the pastor what animal he would come up with. Pastor, if you would slowly start pulling that out of the envelope, I'd like to see what the head of yours looks like. Oh my, what's the head on his? Also a cow. Pastor, continue to pull it up. What's the next part? Also the bird with the red wings there. And finally, Pastor, go ahead and pull it right out. And the fish bottom, he picked the exact same one that you did. Give the pastor a nice hand. Good job, pastor. Good job. Thank you. You see, boys and girls, the reason I chose to do that with the pastor today 
was because the pastor was telling me this week on the phone, he said, Mr. Jim, I try to know my children the best I can. I want to be the best pastor I can for them. I want to lead them the best way I can for Jesus. And that was the reason that he invited me to come up last night when we did the juggling and today when we did the balloon animals. That was because your pastor was looking for really cool ways to talk to you about the Bible and the love of Jesus. But you know what? We're going to meet again this afternoon. Pastor, you get one more shot at this. This afternoon's presentation is at what time? Two o'clock. What time, boys and girls? Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Right after you fill all your bellies with food, then we'll try one more thing this afternoon. But here's where I need you to help me out now. Would everybody please fold their hands? Please fold your hands and let's bow our heads. Dear Jesus, we just thank you for all the blessings and gifts that you've given to us. We thank you for all the awesome animals. So many of them are even pets that we can even have at home and take care of. Oh, dear Jesus, thank you so much for that book of Genesis that tells us how everything came to be through your love, your word, your power. We pray all of this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Thank you so much for that wonderful children's story. And kids, as you go back to your seats, make sure you give your dad a big hug because what is tomorrow? Father's Day. So happy Father's Day, everybody. And as we celebrate our fathers here, let us also praise our Father in heaven as we continue worshiping. Let's continue worshiping. Let's see, let's see.
child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. If you'd uh, join me in prayer, and if it's possible, you can kneel with me as we pray. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you again for your unconditional love. We come to you this morning, some of us filled with joy, some of us with heavy hearts. Many of us have not spoken to you this week because we are so overwhelmed with our life situations. Forgive us, Lord, for focusing on ourselves and forgetting about you, forgetting that it is during these exact times of difficulty and distress that we should first focus on you. As a 1922 hymn reminds us, turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. This morning, we turn our eyes upon you, Lord. We stop focusing our eyes on our problems. We don't disregard them, though. Our health problems, our family disputes, our workplace challenges, our worries about our parents and grandparents getting older, our constant worries about our young children and not so young children, about their health, about their future and well being, our last argument we had with our coworkers, our wives, our significant others, our brother, our sister, our son, our daughter. We stop that now and only focus on you, Lord. Let's all stop and center our attention on Jesus, our Lord and Savior. This is our Father who cares for us more than we care for ourselves. Our great physician who heals every disease that could possibly affect us. Our God who feeds even the birds who don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, our God who reminds us that we are more valuable even than these birds, our God who sent his only son to save us all. As we close our prayer and is our tradition, we pray that you bless our speakers this morning, our own pastors. Speak through them to us. Soften our hearts to allow the Holy Spirit to enter our minds and to see you more clearly. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, it's working now. <laughs> Got it? Blue. There you go. All right. Hallelujah. It's like the Verizon commercial. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. <laughs> All right, I can hear you. Well, sorry for the technical difficulties, um, but happy Sabbath, church family. Now, if this is your first time here, and you know, I know this might seem a little weird. Why is the two pastors sitting, uh, sitting comfortably in the couch, sitting more comfortably than I am in the pews? Well, what we have been doing these past few weeks has been going through a series called The Word. And if this is your first time, what we have been doing is really trying to get into the Word of God and try to experience and see its transformative power. So what we're trying to convey to you guys is that this is what we do in like a pastoral, when we meet as a pastoral team, we would come together and when we're planning a message or doing a joint message like this, we really sit down and we just talk about the Word. And we just talk and really just mind out exactly what is this word all about? And, it, and most importantly, try to mine out where Jesus is in the story. Now, here's the beautiful thing. This message, let me give you some, sh some facts, okay, about the scripture itself, the Bible. Here's some, here's some facts. The Bible is written on three continents in three languages by 40 different people spanning 1,500 years writing on controversial subjects by people, get this, who have never, ever met. And yet, with all those conditions in mind, all 66 books are all in harmony. And that's a beautiful thing about Scripture, the very fact that God's hand was, was helping guide these authors to write this book, 66 books compiled into one, to show the beauty of Scripture and to show that it is only led and moved by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that beautiful? So, Pastor Nestor, what, why do you think this message is for us? So we talked about the beauty of your Scripture. What do you think? Yeah, I think, uh, I think also not only is the, the Scripture beautiful, I also believe that uh, what's beautiful is that we can understand it and we can, we can, question, we can question Scripture. Um, I remember having a conversation with someone, I'll leave this person unnamed, it was not from here, sharing how he grew up in another Asian country. And as, as a young person began to question and ask questions, well, why should we follow this? Why should we go to church? Why should I believe in Christ? Why should I believe in the Bible? And I remember that person's response saying, well, when he would ask his parents or ask people in church, well, because we said so. Because we said so. So, they, so the people, they were, they were responding to, their, their defense was, well, I'm an authority figure, and it's because I have said so, we should follow. And what's so amazing about God is that he gives us the freedom to ask questions. And we can actually ask questions of scripture and to ask him, what does this mean? And by asking questions, we can understand and, and, and enjoy and delight in the knowledge that we find. Speaking about asking questions, I'm going to put a slide on the screen. In about a month, we're going to do a series that I'll be leading uh, on July 18 through 22, five days in a row, five days straight, called Questioning Christianity. Uh, it's part of my doctoral work. It's my project. And I want to invite you, uh, if you have a friend, you've, you've questioned Christianity, not just the Bible, but even questioned Christianity itself. Um, in today's culture, some of the top reasons why people... Uh, choose not to engage with church or Christianity are, number one, uh, based on research this past fall, I think December 2022, uh, that they have a bad experience with church or they say that Christians are hypocrites. Uh, a second reason why people don't engage with Christianity or church is uh, how could a good God allow evil and suffering like COVID and, and everything else and sickness in my family. So 
What's amazing about God is that he gives us the freedom to ask questions, to ask questions about him, to ask questions about faith, and to ask questions about the word. And I'm excited about today's teaching. Pastor Rodney, lead us as we jump into our passage this morning. Yeah, so let me give you a, a quick overview of what we're going to do. So we're going to look straight into application. We're going to do it right off the bat. We're going to do application, and then we're going to exposit the scripture found in John chapter 1. And then after that, we're going to look into the gospel. So let's go into the application part. You know, first and foremost, before we go into the Bible, there's going to be a slide up. Before we go into the Word, we have to have this in mind, that we need to have conviction. What does the slide say in, uh, uh, on, the, on the slide? It should say conviction that Jesus is literally speaking to you. So in our messages from John chapter 1, we learn that the Word, the Word is none other than Jesus Christ. And what the Word is trying to convey to you is that when we read, we need to be convicted that Jesus is literally speaking to you. It's not just head knowledge. It's just not information that we need to know like a textbook. I don't like reading a biology book. Anybody, but, but if you like biology, I know um, some just did some summer school, maybe one, okay. But some people don't normally like reading textbooks on the daily, you know? It's just information. It's hard. It's, it's hard to memorize. It's hard to slog through just the academia of the words. The Bible is not that. The Bible is much more than that. It talks about the word, which is Jesus. It's Jesus literally speaking to you. And so as you read the word, be convicted to know that as you're reading this, it leads you to an understanding of Jesus, and Jesus is speaking to you. So that's first and foremost, that we need to have the conviction that Jesus is literally speaking to you. Now, Pastor Nasser, we have been going through this acronym. Can you describe what that acronym is? Yeah, so... Uh, Pastor Ronnie, let me ask you this question, actually. Sure. In 17 seconds, you told me... 17? Yeah, 17 seconds. Tell me about your experience of how that, that conviction that Jesus is literally speaking to me, how that impacted you this week. All right, yeah. So, I mean, um, let me think about it. So, I was convicted this week, you know, as I re go through my devotionals. There are times that God's speaking to me. And I expressed this last week that God was convicting me to pray more, especially with my wife. And so there are times that I feel that God is convicting me, and I think it's me speaking. But as I think that through, that Jesus is literally speaking to me, it's not myself speaking to myself. It's actually Jesus speaking to me. So when you read the word, let it convict you to know that when something pops up, when you read the word of God, that's Jesus trying to let you know what he's wanting to tell you in that time that you're reading the word. The reason I asked that question, Pastor Rodney, is because that itself, before you even get into the method, it's in your bulletin, by the way, it's on the screen. Uh, before you even get into the SOAP method, just the fact that you know and you had that conviction, the belief that Jesus is talking to you was just was enough for you to say, I'll follow you. And so after you have that conviction, number one, you get into the scripture itself. There's nothing wrong with devotional books. There's nothing wrong with listening to good sermons. There's nothing wrong with reading Christian material, uh, but I don't know about you. I like going to the primary source rather than to the secondary sources. I want to go to Scripture itself because that's where Jesus primarily speaks. And so when I go to Scripture, um, I'm reading it until Jesus speaks to your heart. Now, as I said before, I used to read the Scripture uh, every year. I probably did it four or five consecutive years. And the last few years, I've actually slowed down. And what I'm doing right now is reading a little bit through the Psalms and a little bit through the through the Gospel of Matthew until God speaks to my heart. So that's what I do for Scripture. Observation. Let's talk about observation. We read and reread the passage until we grasp it. Pastor Rodney mentioned that uh, there are different versions, that there are dynamic uh, interpretation, or interpretive or trans dynamic translations and literal translations. Uh, nothing wrong with them. Um, I'm using, we're using the New International Version, which is a dynamic translation. The New Living Translation is also a dynamic translation. If you ever struggle, stumble, uh, struggle with a word like, what does that mean? R sometimes reading a different version, especially more of the dynamic ones, will help you understand it. But uh, if you want to understand act exact words, literal translations would be like the New King James Version, which I use. 
uh, but I primarily use the English Standard Version, which is a more modern literal uh, translation. So we read and reread the passage, even in different versions, until we understand and grasp it. Pastor Rodney, tell us a little bit uh, about some like online resources or other resources that we can use to understand and observe Scripture. So we just talked about different versions. One is not the end-all, be-all. They are helpful for as a tool so that we could get a bigger picture, a bigger understanding of Scripture. Now, if you want to get more deeper, if you want to see the end-all, be-all, it's the original language. So the, they're going to put up a QR code. So if you're tech savvy, go ahead, get your phone, get your camera out, and scan that QR code. That's going to lead you to BibleHub.com. How many of you heard that website before? BibleHub.com. So I'm going to do that myself as an example. So I'm going to scan it. It should lead you to Bible Hub. And what I want you guys to do on the very top, there should be uh, a search bar. It says interreference or key keyword. P type in John chapter 1, verse 9 through 13. That's our text for today. Search it. Now, when you search it, there's going to be two rows at the top. One starts with NIV, and then the one underneath says PAR. On that second, call, uh, second row, it should be abbreviation of Greek, G-R-K. Click on that. Now, when you click on that, then you get to see the Greek language. Then you get to see the translation in English. And then on the left side, you see the Strong's number. So if you want to get deep into the word, English is not the original language. You have to go to the original, which is Greek in the New Testament. So if you want to see, okay, let's see. The word light in Greek is phos. So I type in, if I write that, if I press on the concordance, 5457, the origin, it's a part of speech, a noun, it's a neuter, and the definition is light. The usage is light, a source of light and radiance. So this is a tool that I want you guys to have in your, in your back pocket. If a word does not make sense, if an English word just may not ring a bell to you in terms of what it means, you can look at the other translations, but what's best is to look at the original language. Then it can give you a greater understanding of what the author was trying to convey in his original language. That's really good. That's a really good tool. Uh, we have other Bible programs that we use that we could share with you if you're interested, but that's a useful tool. And what's amazing is that with, when you use these tools is that you can understand it. After the worship service last week, someone came to me and was sharing with me, hey, you know, there was someone who had a doctor behind his name, and they were sharing that, if you really want to understand the scripture, you have to go to the King James Version. And then that person probably said it with some authority and oomph, you know. And I would just share, just because someone might share something with passion doesn't mean it's true. If you want, and let me give you an illustration. Uh, there, are, there are times where my wife, Catherine, who speaks Indonesian, will share, a, share, you know, share an idiom or a joke with her family in Indonesian. And then I'll say, hey, I want to laugh too. Like, tell me what that, tell me the joke. It doesn't translate. It, I can't, tra it's not going to be funny to you. There are words and idioms in their Indonesian language that don't translate over. Yeah. And so that's why, that's why we're saying the King James Version, I mean, that's good, but it's English. We have to go to the original sources, Greek and Hebrew. That's what Old Testament, Hebrew, and Greek. And if you don't understand those words, you can use Bible Hub and go to a concordance and they transliterate it so that you can actually read it in phonetic words, and you can understand original language. That's a little deep. We talked about scripture, number one. We talked about observation. Lead us in application. So the next one, so SOAP. Scripture, observe, A is apply. So bring back the slide. The um, it's apply, which we wrote down, read, respond by repentance. So just like what I said, you know, it's not just content. It's just not information. You don't read the Bible just to get the information and just memorize it. You, it it's great and all. If someone has a Bible answer, you could a Bible question, you can answer it. But really, the ultimate part of the Bible is for you to respond in repentance, which is really what it's saying is surrender your heart. 
that as you read the word, try, just look, just think, okay, Jesus is literally speaking to me. So oh, what, what, is, what are you convicting me to do? And then when God has spoken to you, respond with repentance, saying, Lord, forgive me. Maybe, I, maybe I'm acting too prideful in this one manner that I did with my, with my kids. Or maybe, you know, maybe you've convicted me to pray more or read the word more or understand what scripture's all about more deeper. So respond through repentance by surrendering your heart. That's good. And Pastor Ronnie, just on that application part, I just want to kind of press this home a little bit. I think we rob ourselves the joy uh, of reading scripture and only stopping at interpretation and understanding it. I think bringing it down to the will, the desires, and our motivations, and allowing God to change that, not just my thinking and the way that I perceive God, but to change my character, the way I treat others, the way I conceive or even think about who God is. That's what repentance means, a complete shift and change. And I like how you said that, you know, we have to sit there and we have to, to allow God to speak to us. Like Jesus is literally speaking. So S, scripture, O, observe, A, apply, last but not least, prayer. And we put here, and you can write it in your study guide or in your, your bulletin, uh, we talk to Jesus as a friend. Um, I, I, I have heard of others and and I would probably, I might lean on, lean on this side more of the study interpretation. What is scripture saying? But uh, sometimes I, I am guilty of remembering that it's not just a study time. It's also a, uh, a time to talk to God and to pray to him about these things. And so what I love about the picture of Jesus wanting to speak to us is that he's a friend. And I can actually talk to him about these trials. And so let's say, okay, let's jump down to our passage, right? John chapter 1, um, verse 9, right? That's the beginning, and I'm, I'm kind of setting you up. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. I sit with this verse, uh, and God says, Nestor, um, you, you have been seeking other lights, other good things instead of the true light. Maybe your work. Maybe you've been cherishing your family. You've been cherishing your education more than me. I sit there. I talk to him. Lord, uh, I see this. I want your light, and I don't want to fall for these good lights. I want the best light. And I respond in repentance like you said. And in that prayer time, I'm actually talking to God, and I'm praying to him about these things and repenting. I, I even journal, and I'm, and I'm having a conversation with him. So it's not just me in my own mind, but I'm actually, having, I'm actually talking to him and and Jesus is talking to me, and it's a beautiful conversation that I can have with God. So that's, that's a small example of what, uh, what this looks like. Next week, I want to challenge us to bring your Bibles, physical Bible, digital Bible, that's okay. And we're going to spend some time, some more a lengthy time, lengthier time, uh, unpacking and observing the scriptures together as a, as a, as a community of believers. And reminder... We, we really want you guys to read the word that we are giving away a free Andrew Study Bible. Now, this is only for those who were here last Sabbath. So here's the condition to be entered to win this beautiful NIV Andrew Study Bible. You need to read the Bible as your devotional time for at least 10 minutes every day till the end that we'll do next Sabbath. Next Sabbath, what's gonna happen is you're gonna go on hinzofilm.church slash connect Write down, um, type in your name, and your name will be entered automatically in a raffle that we will probably have like a spinning, um, what is it called? <laughs> like those spinner things to find out randomly who's going to win, and you will, in, you will win a beautiful Andrew Study Bible. It's going to be awesome. Awesome. So, so let's, oh yeah, go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. Oh, go bring ahead. us into the text. That's all. Yeah, so let's, let's get into it. John chapter 1, Re open up your Bibles. Uh, we're going to look at John chapter 1. If you don't know what that is, uh, where that is, it's the fourth gospel. So there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is found in the New Testament. So John chapter 1, we have gone through verse 1. Now we're already in, in verse 9. And so far as a backdrop, we have learned that the word is none other than who? Jesus. And this word is also light. So as we continue, verse 9... Verse 9, it says, the true light, who is that again? It's Jesus. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. So as I sat down on that and I thought about it, okay, the light was coming into the world. This is another, other than Jesus. 
Jesus incarnate coming down to the world. world to uh, Jesus made flesh. So I imagine this, you know, this is Jesus now wanting to reveal himself in flesh, in the flesh. So I, I think of this, you know, I'm old enough to know that I, I'm old enough to say that I've watched movies in VHS. How many of you have watched movies in VHS? What is that? <laughs> VHS for the, for the young people in here is it's, it's a black cartridge where there's film. And you have to rewind it. You might have a machine to fat rewind it so you could bring it back to Blockbuster. I remember that. <laughs> Blockbuster? <laughs> For the I young people. I'm just kidding. So VHS, it was like very grainy. If it was used too many times, you would see like, a, like some like weird like black like film like kind of going over the video. And it wasn't good quality. But when they jumped from VHS to DVD, my mind was blown. I was blown away by the stunning 1080p quality. Now imagine from VHS, now where we are, we're doing VR, AR stuff, but 8K detail. It's amazing to see how much detail you could really see from our, the old videos transferred to 8K. So what, the reason why I'm saying this is that Jesus came into this world, and through Jesus coming into this world, we get to see a greater picture of his goodness. Mm. We have read it from the Old Testament. Everybody has read it, and they were looking for the Messiah. And now that he comes, he's going to reveal himself as a beautiful Messiah who is here to save us from our sins. Isn't that beautiful? That's awesome. Awesome. So we continue on. So he came into this world, and how did the world respond? We're going to look at that in verse 10. Let's look at that. Verse 10, it says, He was in the world, and though the world was made through him... The world did not, what? Recognize him. The world did not recognize him. So even though he was the creator, he was in the beginning, he was with God, and he was God. Even though he was in the beginning, created all things, the world did not, what does it say? Recognize him. Hmm. Which to me is granted, yeah. The world doesn't know, the, doesn't know God. That's, it's rightfully so. But look at this. It gets, it gets even worse. Verse 11, it says, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. One commentator said this. What John the Revelator is trying, uh, what John the Revelator is trying to describe is this, that Jesus went back home. He went to his own people, the people that were supposed to know that he was coming. And what happened when those people saw Jesus? What does it say, the text? But his own did not receive him. Ouch. Mm. So I imagine this, that let's say you are going home. Maybe you, you've been gone for 10, 15, 20 years, and you come home, your parents don't even recognize you. It's me. Maybe they had amnesia. I don't know what happens. But the fact that you come home, no one knows who you are. Your parents who are you? They're defensive. They're not opening the door even though you're knocking. Hey, it's me. I'm home. Maybe your kids are looking at you and just like looking, who are you? Why are you hugging me? Ooh, you know? Maybe your, your dog, your cat, your fish don't even know you. This is how Jesus is feeling. Jesus expecting a grand reunion. Oh, I'm here. Oh, Jesus, welcome back. We're so glad you're here. We're so thankful that you're here to save us. When in reality, his own people don't even recognize him. This is the reality. The world and his own people don't even know who he is. So this depicts, verse 10, 11, a, a world of darkness, but there is hope. Not everyone has rejected the word or the light, which is Jesus. Let's continue. Verse, verse 12. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become what? The children of God. Now, here's the beautiful thing. Though the world and though his people reject him, there's going to be a group of people that believe in his what? In his name that by believe in his name, who, gave, who he gave the right to become the children of God. He's giving it to us, so to speak. It's like a gift. He's 
pushing it. He's giving us the gifts nicely, and all we have to do is what? Take it. He's giving it to us. Not only that, what does it say? He gave us the right to become the children of God. I don't know what families, family dynamics that you, you, are, you have been in. I don't know if your family is broken or maybe you don't like to claim your, your last name because maybe your last name comes with connotations of trauma or, or things that you just don't want to re remember. But here's the good thing. God is giving us the right, the beautiful, wonderful status to be called the children of God. And all we have to do is receive it. And that's the beautiful thing. I remember when um, we just, me and, my, uh, me and Jillian just got married. I've never, ever told anybody that she was my wife until that one moment, the day after the wedding. When someone said, oh, wow, you guys, a beautiful couple. Yeah, that's my wife. I felt so weird saying that before. I've never said that before. So when I said wife, it gave a certain elevation of status that, yes, she's my wife and I'm her husband. And it gave a sense of completeness for me. And so it's beautiful to know that wherever you are in your life, wherever dynamics that you have with your family, you can claim that you are a child of God. How does that make you feel, Pastor Nestor, to know that you are a child of God? Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, yeah, even, even though uh, I, I love the fact that I'm a child of God not based upon anything that I've done but the mere fact that God has birthed me as a child of God, that I, have a, that I, I can talk to him as a, as a child talks to his parent. It's amazing. Yeah, so let's continue. So he tells us that we have the right to become children of God, and this status is given to us. How? Look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, children born not of natural descent. So that means that the, it doesn't depend on what family we're from. We have the right. What else does it say? Nor of human decision or a husband's will. So that's really saying it's not through our own willpower that we become children of God. But it says, but born of God. This is initiated none other than God himself. It's not by our own works. It's not what we can do. It's not from our family lineage. It is only by the initiation of God himself. And the key word is found back in verse 12. It says, but yet to all who receive him, to those who believe him. And that's the beautiful truth as I was reading through this text. It's telling us that the barrier of entry is to believe. Say believe. believe. Say with more emphasis. Believe. believe. That's really it. All you need to do in order to be a child of God is to believe, trust in the one who initiated it for us. So uh, to conclude my section, you know, my, my son is interesting. For, for, sometimes my son calls me Uncle Rodney. It's like, hi, Uncle Rodney. <laughs> like, hey, Kai, <laughs> what's up? And you know, every time he calls me Uncle Rodney, I feel a little weird. It's, that's not my name. Well, it is my name, but I say, Kai, you don't have to call me Uncle Rodney. And now he's in the face of asking why. And we go down this really long rabbit hole of answering, the question, answering his question of why. And so I, I, he says, why? Well, I'm your dad. Why? Well, you know, you don't have to call me Uncle Rodney. I'm, I'm your father. And even when you were in your mommy's womb, I loved you. And there's no, there's no change in your status. You're my son, and I am your father. And it's so beautiful to know that regardless of where you are in life, no, regardless of what family you come from, regardless of whatever social economic status you come from, you're not just, he's not just Uncle God to you. <laughs> he's your father. And even before you were born, he loved you. He loves you even when you're born, and you have that right to be a child of God. To me, that's so beautiful. It gives me that mm, gushy feeling when you feel loved. That is what God wants.
for you to be a child of God. So Pastor Rodney, the title of today's message is What Makes Us God's Children? What makes us God's children then? What makes us God's children is believing in his name. Hmm. Belief. So just walk in that identity. Yes. Believe in, the, believe in that identity. Yes. I love that. I love that. Pastor Rodney, thank you for the powerful insights that you brought out. When I, when I look at scripture, uh, and especially as a believer in the Messiah and Jesus Christ, I, I, I always ask the question, so then how do I see Jesus in what I just read? And I believe that if, we don't, if I don't do that, if we don't do that, we're actually missing out on really understanding scripture for all it's worth. And so uh, bear with me for a few minutes as, I actually, as we try to explore and see Jesus in this passage. So go back to John chapter 1, verse 13. I'm going to break down these phrases. Verse 13. Uh, actually, start with 12. Yet to all who did, be- did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And then look at verse 13. Children born not out of natural descent. What, does John- what is John saying to the original audience in Ephesus who were mostly a pagan group and they had some Jewish people as well? What was he saying? He was saying to the, especially to the Jews, that your heritage and your race, the Jewish race, are irrelevant to spiritual birth. So being a Jew by birth and race no longer deemed someone a child of God. Now, before the Messiah, before Christ came, people could claim, I'm a child of God because I'm of Abraham. I'm of Jewish race. But now John John is very radical, very revolutionary, now inserting, now he's not inserting the Jesus, the Messiah figure because he already came. He's just witnessing of the Messiah who came into human existence and now is now changing uh, the very way that we interact with God and no longer is our status based on our race or our heritage, but based solely upon the fact that God initiates that and be, makes us children of God. Now, how does that relate to, 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 to us today? Listen to me carefully. Our race, our culture, our church affiliation, or our denominational commitment are not the source of our spiritual birth. Not my race. I can enjoy my race. In fact, I'm, we're, we're, you're wearing a, uh, what is that called? A barong. A barong, right? Yep. In, 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 in Filipino culture, that's a, a, a customary a cultural garb. I'm wearing a one to, to represent my wife's country, Indonesia. We appreciate the culture, right? And I'm, as much as we enjoy the culture, that doesn't make us children of God. Culture, race, church affiliation, denominal, denominational commitment, these are great things. We honor and appreciate these things. But the source of our spiritual birth is an act of God in our lives. Mm. And then he continues in verse 13, children born not of natural descent, then he says, nor of human decision or a husband's will. That means that spiritual birth is not the act of procreation or physical intimacy. Even a husband saying, I will to have children. Nope, that's not how we're born. John is saying, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, (coughs) but born of God. What does that mean? To be born of God. To be born of God means that I have spiritual birth. Spiritual birth is an act of God. Now, there might be some people who are sitting here or watching online. You're feeling like, man, I just feel spiritually dead. Or I'm starting to come alive in in understanding God and this yearning for God. In my research, in my studies, uh, there are a lot of people today who are disaffiliated with church. But many people... A growing number of people, especially Generation Z and millennials, who are saying, but I still desire spirituality. There's still within the human heart a desire for transcendence for this this God. And the question is, where does that awakening come from? How in the world, based upon the text, do we come alive or how can we be spiritually born again? This is amazing. I had not seen this before and I had not seen this connection. That language in verse 13, Pastor Rodney, children born of not of natural descent, but born of God, is actually similar to the language in John chapter 3, just two chapters later, when Nicodemus comes on the scene, this Pharisee of Pharisees, this church leader, and he's talking to Jesus, and he comes to come to Jesus at night, and he says, teacher, uh, no one can see, uh, you're, you are one that comes from God, right? And then Jesus 
it says instead of you know, telling Nicodemus you need to, to follow the, the Torah even more faithfully, he says in verse 3 of John chapter 3, Verily, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. What? Born again? And then verse 5, because you know, Nicodemus, Nicodemus is confused. Jesus says, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. And so what he's saying to Nicodemus is, is hey, hey Nicodemus, you think you're a child of God? You, you're going to be part of the kingdom of God based on your heritage as a Jew? Uh-uh. You got it wrong. You got to be born again. And this is what he means. And here's the similar language to John chapter 1 verse 13. Check this out. Verse 6. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. There it is. Similar language. John just said in John chapter 1 verse 13, children born not out of natural descent. So he's saying the same thing in John chapter 3, verse 6, that flesh, human beings, give birth to human beings, but the Holy Spirit give birth, gives birth to spirit or to spiritual children, which means that my spiritual birth is not based on, I have no, uh, I have no hook or I have no advantage, I have no claim on becoming a child of God. It's an act of God. Now, Pastor Rodney, here's the question. How in the world then can I be born again and experience that change? Jesus gives us the clue in the same chapter because Nicodemus, check this out, he's confused. He asks in verse 9, how can this be? How can I be born again? How can I have spiritual life? How can I come alive? There might be some thinking, I've, I've, been, go I've been in a desert spiritually. I am dry. I am as dry as a desert. And I see the, a mirage of water, and every time I get closer to that, I get closer and closer to that, to that body of water, it's only a mirage, and it disappears. I'm, I'm looking for, I am looking for a drink of the living water. I want that. How can I have spiritual birth? Jesus gives the answer to Nicodemus, who's wanting the same thing. And in two verses, the last two red letters of Jesus, if you have a red letter Bible, in verses 14 and 15, check it out. Here's the answer. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Jesus, why are you talking about this? Where in Scripture was, did Moses lift up a snake in the wilderness? What in the world are you talking about? Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, a Jew who knew this story. And if you go back to Numbers 21, check this out. Numbers chapter 21, let me read the story to you. Look at verse 4, Numbers 21 verse 4. The Israelites are traveling. Verse 4 says they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. Why did you bring us out when we, we uh, enjoyed a buffet in Egypt and we're starving out here? The people speak out against God, Pastor Rodney. They're, they're saying like, God, what's up, with, what's up with you? You brought us out here to die. They're challenging God. They're not trusting God's plan. And you know what happens next? Verse 6. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. Ouch. God sends fiery snakes. The snakes bite the people. Why in the world would God send snakes? I believe that the snakes are a symbol of justice. And here's the point. Whenever there's a misdemeanor, there's a penalty. Whenever there's a crime, there's punishment. Whenever there's an offense, there's a penalty. Look what happens in verse 7 of Numbers 21. The people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. He's praying. The people say to Moses, come on, we've sinned. We've messed up. We've made a mistake by calling God out, by saying we don't trust you. Please pray for us. Did God take the snakes away? Yes or no? God did not take the snakes away. Why is that? God did not take the snakes away. Rather, he put a, a snake on a pole. Because the text says in verse 8, the Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a snake and put it up on a pole that when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. 
Why didn't God take away the snake? You know why? God could have taken the snakes away, but that would not have cleared the penalty for their sin. God did not take away the snake because a penalty had to be paid for their offense. God did not take away the snakes because a penalty had to be paid for their offense. And the question is, who in the world would pay that price? Who would pay the price for their penalty of rebelling against the Father? Who was going to pay that price? <laughs> the text says, make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who was bitten can look at it and live. Have you bitten and bitten by the sting and the pangs of sin? Who's going to pay that price? Yes, we pay the price. We, we bear the consequences for the sin that we have, the selfishness against God and the selfishness against other people, but who's going to pay for it? Oh, man. 7,000 7, years later, I believe that God was giving a picture of someone else who would come on the scene, and he completes it by the person of the name of Jesus. And Jesus is talking to this man, Nicodemus, this Jew, and saying, hey, someone had to pay the penalty. Let me tell you about him. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness... So the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. The serpent on a pole symbolized Jesus who would come and pay the penalty for our sin several thousand years later. It would be like you and I going to court, or let's say that I went to court, and I'm sitting before a jury, a jury <clears throat> and the judge. Let's say that you're the judge. And... I'm sitting and I, I committed an, an egregious crime, a horrible crime. And rumor around the, uh, the courtroom is that Nestor deserves a life sentence. He deserves life for the crime that he committed. So the jury step away. They deliberate for 45 minutes to an hour. I wait patiently, thinking about the, 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 the horror of my crime, thinking about the penalty that, that uh, I'm going to incur incur because of my sin and because of my transgression and then the the jury comes they give a statement to the to the judge the judge reads it and you're the judge you say the judge says you are sentenced to life in prison oh, never gonna see my wife never gonna see my kids again never oh, I'm not I'm gonna live life in prison so I'm ready for my sentence, but then that same judge who announces the penalty, he says, Nestor, listen up, but I'm going to take the penalty so that you can live. I'm going to take that penalty so that you can live. And friends, this is exactly what I, I think that John is saying in John chapter 1. To be born of God <laughs> means that I am born of God I'm a child of God and he loves me so much the father loves me so much that he's willing to give his life for me and pay the penalty for the sin that I've committed what kind of God is this and so the question is as we land this plane how is it possible for us to be born and to believe yeah you can pray more we need to pray yes we need to get into scripture and we can read but I believe that the number one ba way based on John chapter 3 that we can be born again and come alive to be spiritually alive is to expose ourselves to the sacrificial love of Jesus. That's it. We have to expose ourselves to the sacrificial love of Jesus and that is the source. And Pastor Rodney, I don't know about you, but I want that. What about you? I, I do too. And you know, as I was hearing Pastor Nestor talk and expound on scripture this is what makes scripture so beautiful that as you read the word and as you start to ponder how is this talking about Jesus it leads us to an, a greater beautiful picture not 4k not 8k more resolutions that you could ever imagine a beautiful understanding and depiction of our love of G God's love for us and so I mean just to conclude just what Nicodemus um, what that Nick, the conversation with Nicodemus in verse 16 in verse 16 it says for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life my friends 
this is what makes scripture beautiful. That as we look into scripture, it leads us right back to Jesus. So claim that identity. Claim it. Because he's giving it to you. You have the right to be called the children of God. And as Pastor Nestor described, that through that sac sacrifice that Jesus has done on the cross, you could claim it because he has done it for you. So as we, as we close here today, as we stand up and as a praise team comes up, reflect that you are a child of God. Claim it. It's your right. Because Jesus paid it all on the cross. So as a praise team comes up, and if you feel compelled that you want to continue in um, studying the Word of God, maybe you want someone to guide you along the way, go to hinzelfilam.church slash connect, or there's a connect card in front of you. Go ahead, write your name. Write down if you want to talk to a pastor, if you want to have Bible studies, or if you want to serve. Come talk to us. We are more than willing to guide you in this journey in understanding that this word of God leads us to Jesus. Let's sing our, our closing song. Let's stand as we sing our last song.
Let's pray together. Father, this song is so powerful. Who the Son sets free will be free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. What makes us our God's children? Jesus, the Messiah who came, the Messiah who died and restored a relationship with the Father. And so, Father, we receive you. Forgive me and forgive us of walking in a false identity. May we cling to Christ. Help me, help us to cling to Christ, to receive him, to walk in that confidence that I am a child of God. Please, Lord, do that in my heart. Do it in our hearts. We give all glory and worth and power to the Lamb of God who was slain for us. In Jesus' name, let all of God's people say amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you for joining us in worshiping the Messiah at Hinzo Fairland this week. You're welcome to join us for Potluck. Also at two o'clock, you don't wanna miss our program for our children. So come, come at two o'clock. God bless you. Bless others through your love this week. God bless. Yeah.
Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am.